Well, what a pleasure it is to be here today. Thank you guys for coming. So we're going to be talking about UIP on imaging, more or less. But we're not just going to talk about UIP as it is. We're going to kind of talk about where UIP came from, so pulmonary fibrosis in general. And we're going to talk about the rationale for why this was changed. It wasn't just uh, so academics like myself can publish more, I swear. There is actually a rationale to why things were changed from 2011 to 2018. These are my disclosures, none of which are directly pertinent to this talk. Okay, so let's talk about where we're going to be going here. We're going to start talking about IPF 101, so just, you know, for people who maybe don't know much about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or UIP, usual interstitial pneumonitis, we'll just get everyone caught up as best as we can. Then we're going to talk about UIP. So why, do we, why have I said UIP probably 20 times already? It's the most important pattern and in most clinics the most common pattern of pulmonary fibrosis that you'll see. So that's why we focus on it. We're going to talk about that new UIP classification system that I alluded to, but again, with reference to the historical 2011 guidelines UIP classification system, because I'm assuming most people in the audience probably already know that. So let's leverage what people know to learn what's new. And then we will talk about a little bit of controversy, but let's get to that later. Let's talk about the good stuff first. All right, so I'm sure most of the people in the audience are very, very well um, aware that in 2011 we had these guidelines, this three-tier UIP classification system. So if you saw pulmonary fibrosis on high-resolution chest CT, this is how you're supposed to describe it, either as a UIP pattern, possible UIP pattern, or inconsistent with UIP pattern. If you don't know this, if you ha haven't memorized this yet, please ignore this. Please just look, you know, look at your smartphone right now. Right? Please don't, don't look at me, don't look at the screen, because this is now defunct. We have new guidelines released in 2018. And so this is 2017, this was, you know, PAP, so this is published ahead of print. Uh, but in 2018, the Fleischner White Paper officially released their guidelines on UIP classification on CT. And so we went from a three-tier classification system to a four-tier classification system. And so this four-tier classification is actually better. And I will describe the rationale for why we went to four tiers and why the nomenclature of some of these classifications were changed. So now we have typical UIP, probable UIP, <laughs> CT pattern indeterminate for UIP, and then CT features most consistent with non-IPF diagnosis. The great thing is that, again, if you, were, if you knew the 2011 guidelines well, the UIP pattern, possible UIP pattern, and then inconsistent with UIP, there are many corollaries with the 2018 guidelines relative to the 2011 guidelines. So we're actually in luck. There's actually not that much to memorize. More, more things to understand than memorize in this talk. Before we get to the UIPCT classification system, let's again talk about the, the very, very basics of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, is the most common in most clinics and definitely the most mortal type of pulmonary fibrosis. Remember, it is a clinical diagnosis though. So we as radiologists don't make a diagnosis of IPF per se, right? With clinical correlation, perhaps we could if we were to go into the EMR, but in isolation, imaging never makes a diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis because you know, the name just says it all. It's idiopathic. There has to be no known cause for the patient's pulmonary fibrosis. And we, as radiologists, unless you see patients in a clinic, we're not going to be able to make that assessment, at least not in any, uh, with any sort of accuracy. Now, UIP, usual interstitial pneumonia, is the imaging and histological correlate of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And so essentially, all cases of IPF are going to be UIP, OK? All cases of IPF are going to be UIP. But not all cases of UIP are IPF, OK? So that's a little factoid to remember. But just remember, if you, if you have a patient with IPF, they have to have a UIP something, whether it's on histology or on imaging. Remember, though, in this setting, the setting of interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis, pathology is not the gold standard. I don't know any other disease process where pathology is not the gold standard. If anyone in the audience knows of one, afterwards, please come up and, and tell me so I could you know, talk about it um, in, in future talks. But to my knowledge, in any other field, pathology really is the gold standard. And so in the setting of interstitial lung disease, it's not. Multidisciplinary discussion is the gold standard. Indeed, in the setting of multidisciplinary discussion, a pathologist, a good pathologist, not even just an, an average pathologist, but someone who's a world-renowned pathologist, 
will change his or her diagnosis one out of six times in the setting of MDD. It kind of blew my mind when I first saw that data, right? Because as a medical student, as a resident, uh, even as a fellow, I just thought pathology was always gold standard. It's not, and MDD is certainly not. Bad news about IPF, universally fatal. Here's the survival, this five-year survival. So, we see, so you see this, these, uh, these bar graphs here. So IPF uh, has worse survival than lung cancer, but not by much. And in fact, if you get all comers of non-small cell lung cancer, it's actually probably similar, similar in terms of five-year survival. But far superior survival to patients compared to patients with colorectal cancer or breast cancer. So you don't want IPF. You don't want anyone in your family to have IPF. Heck, you don't even want any of your worst enemies to have IPF. You're not those kind of people I know, right? So uh, IPF is a bad player. So how does one diagnose idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? Well, again, idiopathic is in a name. You gotta exclude known causes for interstitial lung disease. So first step is a detailed history and physical. Again, not done by us, usually done by a pulmonologist or uh, a good internal medicine doc. Once they, you have excluded a known cause for interstitial lung disease, then what? Well, we are central to diagnosis as radiologists. HRCT really is the, the next step, always the next step. And there, if you have a UIP pattern, or now we call it a typical UIP pattern, or a probable UIP pattern, which is a little, this is a little different, a little different compared to the old guy. So if you have those two patterns, typical UIP or probable UIP, with a high pretest probability of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, you're done. Drop that mic. You, as a radiologist, have actually achieved the diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. We have obviated biopsy, which in this clinical setting is very important. So patients with pulmonary fibrosis, uh, more and more data shows that if you actually do surgical lung biopsy, oftentimes you set off this acute exacerbation cascade, and those patients oftentimes will live far shorter than a year, most of them shorter than three months. So we are, as a community in interstitial lung disease, are moving away from biopsy. We are becoming essentially the, the histology and pathology, because I'll tell you, when I first started doing ILD in, the, in, in, the, in academic practice, we used to biopsy, I don't know, uh, percentage-wise, maybe 10%, maybe more, 15%, maybe up to 20%, uh, depending on the year or the place uh, of our patients with interstitial lung disease. Now I'd say it's, it's well less than 5%. So we as radiologists, we, we are the imaging and histology sort of combined in one. In so very difficult cases, still histology will be pursued. Okay. So what if you don't have a typical UIP or probable UIP pattern, then what? Well, then you consider pathology, consider doing surgical lung biopsy, you consider doing bronchoalveolar lavage, but that's again, that's up to the clinicians, the pulmonologists and the internal medicine docs to decide. But based on that, then you get together in the setting of multidisciplinary discussion and you, and you duke it out. You try to figure out what the patient has in terms of their best diagnosis. And so this doesn't, so, so I know that everyone's getting busier, it's hard to do this, um, but you know, it doesn't have to be done at the same time in the same room. It could be done um, temporarily um, discongruous. Con it could be done at different times. I haven't had all my coffee yet, so I can't, I can't think of the word to say, right? But it could be done essentially uh, via text, via email, assuming HIPAA compliance, right? So these patients aren't dying right now, right? Um, they, don't, they don't have aortic dissection, they don't have PE. You don't need the answer like, yesterday. This can wait a couple of days, even a couple of weeks to figure out what's going on. So emails back and forth, text back and forth, there's no reason why you can't do that to save everyone time. Because again, as everyone's getting busier, hard to break from your normal routine and go to a, a specific conference with other people who ha actually have the same issues that you do. All right, let's talk about the UIP pattern. So the UIP pattern on CT, or now we call it the typical UIP pattern CT, is pretty powerful because it's where we as radiologists are most accurate and probably most helpful to our clinicians. So the correctness of a first choice diagnosis of UIP on CT from a radiology standpoint, from, ra from a radiologist, and it is important that it comes from a radiologist, is somewhere around 90% based on the literature. Now if you looked at the correctness of a confidence first choice diagnosis, it's through the roof, it's around 95%. That's pretty much as good as you can get in medicine. I don't think there's anything else that I know of where the accuracy is greater than 95%, except, except maybe things based on genetics. This is tempered by the fact that in only about a half of cases can you make that diagnosis on imaging, but still pretty good. This is very important. So that pattern is now called the typical UIP pattern. The great thing about the typical UIP pattern is that in 2011, if you knew what UIP looks like, 
you still know what UIP looks like in 2018. Very, very little has changed. So what are we looking for here? Peripheral basal predominant pulmonary fibrosis characterized by reticulation. You have to have subpleural honeycombing, right? So those little cysts in this, the most peripheral portion of the lung, which are lining up in rows or stacking upon each other, with or without traction bronchiexis. You don't actually have to have traction bronchiexis to call a typical UIP pattern. But the last thing is actually very important. Absence of features listed as consistent with a non-IPF diagnosis. So things that would draw you away from that UIP pattern toward other patterns, you can't see any of that. If you look at the Fleischner guidelines, they do say that sometimes in the zonal distribution, so that's up and down, superior and inferior, it can be diffuse, and I agree with that. Uh, but most of these cases are gonna, again, be peripheral and based or predominant. So here's an example here. Um, so yeah, I think a medical student would probably make this diagnosis, right? It's just it's rip -roaring pulmonary fibrosis, all those cysts at the lung bases lining up in rows, stacking upon each other. Uh, this is a patient with a classic UIP pattern of pulmonary fibrosis. No findings to suggest an alternative diagnosis. So that's a florid case. This is, this is, you never actually see that anymore, to be honest. Like I don't see it at least. Maybe it gets picked off in the community. This is what I see more often now. So I see little cystic things where I, I, have, to, I have to sort of blow it up and I have to scroll back and forth and say, is that honeycombing or not? Is it just a little bit traction bronchiectasis or bronchiolectasis? But I think in the posterior aspect, that left lower lobe, I think there are enough cysts there, subpleural cystic abnormality, where I'd be pretty confident there is some honeycombing back there. Clearly a peripheral predominant here. Zonal distribution shows that it is indeed basal predominant. So peripheral, basal predominant pulmonary fibrosis, subpleural honeycombing, no other features that suggest an alternative diagnosis, UIP pattern, obviated biopsy. Do not biopsy these patients. We don't need to do it. Okay, but this pattern more or less has not changed since 2011. So UIP, they've just changed the, the nomenclature to typical UIP for really no good reason, right? It's, UIP should have just stayed UIP, but it is what it is. So that's good. Now let's talk about probable UIP. So probable UIP, this nomenclature has changed. So this was formerly known as possible UIP. Now we call it probable UIP. But again, good news. In 2011, if you knew what possible UIP was, more or less, you still know what probable UIP is because nothing has changed, uh, just the nomenclature more or less. So also, if you remember what UIP, or now we call it typical UIP, looks like, peripheral, basal predominant pulmonary fibrosis with reticulation and subpleural honeycombing, you know what probable UIP looks like. It's exactly the same, more or less, except for one small caveat, uh, no subpleural honeycombing. So that's really a powerful differentiator of a UIP, probable UIP versus uh, typical UIP. Here's an example. Clearly peripheral, clearly basal predominant pulmonary fibrosis characterized by reticulation, no subpleural honeycombing, no findings that suggest an alternative non-IPF diagnosis. This is something we call probable UIP. Formerly, we would have called it possible UIP. Whoops. All right. So let's talk about words. Let's talk about that nomenclature, you know, the, the shift from possible UIP to probable UIP. So words are very powerful things because I think it sort of, it changes your mindset. And I, I think that's the rationale be behind why the, the nomenclature was changed from possible to probable. So this is an interesting study for people who like uh, psychology and behavioral economics. I really do, it's, just, it's fascinating stuff. Uh, but these researchers in the Harvard Business Review, they went up to 1,700 just normal people, lay people, and, and they just asked them, if I say this word, how sure of you of that actually being true? So it's things like likely or mostly or slam dunk or home run, right? These sort of terms, how sure of you? Pretty fascinating stuff. And so here, here's an example here with, uh, you know, the, these, um, the, uh, all the way on the right, these are areas where people thought that was 100% confidence. And then over here, all the way on the left, people thought 0% confidence. So never means never, always means always. That's obvious. But then all these terms are sort of in between, right? So let's blow it up. Let's look at possible or possibly. So possibly less than 50% confidence, right? We see that here. Probable, greater than 50% confidence. And so that's interesting, isn't it? So, so possible and probable, which to me, you know, didn't actually make that much of a difference. Um, actually to, I guess, the lay people or the majority of people out there, maybe I just don't know English that well, um, is, is vastly different. So possible to most people means less than 50%. Probable means greater than 50% likelihood of something happening. So now let's look at this pattern, okay? So probable UIP, again, formerly known as possible UIP pattern. If you look at the data, the literature, you will see that if you have this pattern on CT, the yield on UIP is somewhere in the 80 to 90% range for, you, for, for UIP and pathology, right? So what am I saying? If you see this pattern, 
89% time is you're going to have UIPN pathology if you were to pursue pathology, 80 to 90%. So now, now it seems obvious. Why would you call this pattern possible UIP when possible means less than 50% likelihood, when in fact it should be more like probable UIP, which again implies that it's greater than 50% likelihood. Just, just, just as a side, um, the actual correct term we should have used is usual. So usual is actually like around, around 80, a little bit or above 80%. But for obvious reasons, we cannot call this usual, usual interstitial pneumonia, right? That just wouldn't fly. So I think that's why they choose the term probable UIP. And again, it changes your mindset. Um, so based on this, the new um, guidelines, Fleischner guidelines, actually suggest that these patients should no longer get biopsy with a high pretest probability of IPF. I alluded to that before. In 2011, this same pattern, which we, again, we called possible UIP at that time, we still biopsied those patients. We would do, we, it was suggested we do surgical lung biopsy in these patients, even with the morbidity and mortality associated with that procedure. But now, now that we understand exactly the UIP yield on pathology with this pattern, now it's suggested we do not biopsy these patients if you have a high pretest probability of IPF before you get that CT scan. So actually, this is very important. Okay, so we talked about typical UIP. We've talked about probable UIP. Let's talk about, we're, you know, and probably for those astute people in the audience, you've probably noticed that I've skipped this one, but let's, this is a little harder, so let's just go to this. Let's talk about CT features most consistent with non-IPF diagnosis. So again, good news. So if you knew what the inconsistent with UIP pattern was on CT in 2011, you know what this pattern is, more or less exactly the same. And so if any of these seven features are present on CT, you can invoke this pattern, this category. And so these patients certainly would require biopsy in a lot of situations to establish the diagnosis. And so it's hard to remember seven things, so I clumped them together. I clump distribution. So is the distribution not right for UIP? Instead of being, instead of being uh, lower lung preponderant, is it upper or mid-lung preponderant? Instead of being peripheral predominant, is it more central parabronchovascular? Is there too much density in the lungs? So extensive ground glass abnormality, above the degree of reticulation, a lot of consolidation in the lungs, diffuse nausea lung disease, all these things that really, don't, they don't jive with UIP. So you would invoke this pattern. Or is there not enough density in the lungs? So is it hypodensity, these hypodense things? So extensive mosaic attenuation or air trapping with sharply defined margins, or frankly, diffuse cystic lung disease, all these things, they don't really make sense in the setting of UIP and would draw you to this pattern. Here's some examples here. Beautiful pattern here of mild pulmonary fibrosis with ground glass opacity and reticulation at the lung bases. Clear subpleural sparing, if not central lung preponderance here. Also note the mildly dilated esophagus. There is also some traction bronchiex as well. Corona reformation shows a similar pattern, but again, the subpleural sparing here is, uh, this is to die for, isn't it? I mean, this is, you never see this anymore. I don't, I don't know why, but this beautiful subpleural sparing. So this would be very, very inconsistent with uh, UIP, using the previous terminology, and now we call this consistent with a non-IPF diagnosis. And I think that most people in the room know what this pattern is. This is a classic NSIP pattern, non-specific interstitial pneumonitis. Another example here, this basal predominant ground glass opacity, minimal superimposed consolidation. This patient had history of dermatomyositis. This is a combined NSIP and organized pneumonia pattern. A uh, little, little pearl here, these patients with myositis who developed this sort of pattern, NSIP and OP combined, or, or just one of those, uh, for some reason they're exquisitely sensitive to corticosteroids, so after corticosteroids, I bet you after six weeks this would just all melt away, but pretty classic. Another non-IPF diagnostic pattern here, clearly upper lung preponderant pulmonary fibrosis. This does not jive with UIP. The UIP, again, peripheral basal predominant pulmonary fibrosis. And, and just as a kicker, there's also superimposed diffuse nodular lung disease in this patient with sarcoidosis. Inspiratory image here on the left, expiratory image here on the right. There's a lot of things here that are not going with UIP. This is a non-IPF diagnostic category. On the inspiratory image on the left, we see a lot of ground glass opacity with mosaic attenuation. These these dark areas that look like polygons. Those are secondary pulmonary lobules. And in expiratory imaging, these areas are shown to represent a, a significant amount of air trapping. So this patient had hypersensitivity pneumonitis, non-IPF diagnostic category. Okay, and that brings us to this pattern, the CT pattern indeterminate for UIP. And so why did I leave this for last? It's because there's nothing to lean on. There's nothing from 2011 to sort of like use as sort of your crutch. Uh, this is completely new. 
Um, this is a heterogeneous pattern. No one really knows what it is, but I like it. It's a really, really good pattern. And I think that's, I mean, it's logical why we went from three to four because now we can include this pattern. So what is it? It's if it doesn't fit into any other category or if it's really too subtle to call. If it's like just a kind of mild stuff where you're questioning if it's real or not. I mean, it really is for hard cases and I love it. Here's an example from Dr. Lynch's paper in the, in the Lancer Respiratory Medicine. This is actually the Fleischner White Paper. So we see these axial and uh, coronal images and there's just a little bit too much ground glass opacity. There's a little bit of mosaic attenuation. There's uh, even the distribution in the axial plane is not quite peripheral. There's, there's actually a little bit more central preponderance than you'd like to see. But you kind of throw up your hands because none of these findings are so floored where you just kind of jump to that last non-IPF diagnosis category. This is a hard one. So this is appropriate for that indeterminate for UIP category. Another example here, basal predominant pulmonary fibrosis. There is ground glass opacity here, but there's a lot of reticulation as well. I don't know. I wouldn't know what to do with this exactly. Like I, maybe I'd try to pigeonhole into the, 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 the least confident UIP pattern using the 2011 guidelines. But again, this is hard enough where I would probably put this in the indeterminate for UIP pattern. Hard case. Distribution also in the axial plane. Is it diffuse? Is it peripheral? Hard to say. Okay, so as I alluded to before in the previous guidelines, there is no place for these hard cases. And up to 10 to 30% of cases are actually difficult to subcategorize if you look at the literature. I think in actual clinical practice, probably it's closer to 10%, 10-15%, but the literature says 10 to 30%. Uh, and unfortunately, using the previous guidelines, there was a tendency to miscategorize these. And I'll show you why in just one second. So here are the previous guidelines again. So again, we have a three-tier system. We got UIP, possible UIP, inconsistent with UIP, right? So everyone here are in this room is a human being. There are no AI algorithms, I don't think. So um, just being humans, if you have something hard, you know, something like you don't know where to put it, right, in terms of categories, where would you put it? Would you put it on one of the extremes, UIP or inconsistent UIP? No, right? We just shove it in the middle. That's what humans do, right? That's why my residents, instead of coming down hard and saying something's mild or moderate or severe, they're always saying this like mild to moderate, moderate to severe stuff. And I'm like, you know, let's just try to, try to like come down on one thing, right? But it's just humans. Humans don't like to do that, right? So, so if you have a hard case using the previous guidelines, you would shove it into this possible UIP category, yes? I think most people would agree. However, if you look at the data, there, there isn't much data on the indeterminate for UIP uh, imaging category, but there is, there is a little bit, right? So if you look at this indeterminate category, the yield of UIP on pathology is around 55%, at least in this single study. And that's most similar to these patients with the non-IPF diagnosis uh, imaging pattern, formerly known as inconsistent with UIP. Very similar, 60%, 55%, very similar and very, very different from patients who had a probable slash possible UIP pattern where the UIP yield was around 82% and very different from the patients who had a typical UIP pattern on CT where they had a UIP yield of 90%. Okay, so if anything, using the previous guidelines, you should have shoved this into the inconsistent with UIP pattern, but they didn't do that. People just don't do that. And, more, and some data that presented at the RSNA showed that almost all these patients who had a hard pattern on CT, something that we would now call indeterminate for UIP, they're shoved in, they were shoved into that possible UIP pattern. So this is better. It's better to have a place for uh, hard cases rather than trying to pigeonhole them somewhere where it doesn't fit. Okay, so I talked about a lot of the good news. Uh, there's a little bit of bad news. Um, I didn't tell you about this. So there actually is a competing guidelines to the Fleischner guidelines. This is the multi-society ATS guidelines. Uh, so. Unfortunately, someone might say, well, there's more to remember here. Actually, there, there isn't actually more to remember. Um, the guidelines, their guidelines, the multi-sided guidelines, and the flexion guidelines are almost exactly the same. Typical UIP, they call UIP. Probable UIP, still probable UIP. Indeterminate for UIP, still indeterminate for UIP. And instead of calling it non-IPF diagnosis, they call it alternative diagnosis. So more or less, exactly the same. There are some nuances, but the trick is just use one and go with it. Find out what they're using at your center and just run with that and then put this table on your, your desktop. Okay, unfortunately there is one big apparent difference between the Fleischner guidelines and the multi-sided guidelines. It's actually kept me up at night, first time I realized it. So again, I alluded to this before, the Fleischner guidelines say that if you have a high pretest probability of IPF and you have a typical UIP pattern or a probable UIP pattern, you don't need to biopsy those patients. You have made the diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And again, this is big. That probable UIP pattern is really big because 
formerly in the 2011 guidelines, we would biopsy those patients, even though there's uh, morbidity and mortality associated with that. But now we don't. Now we don't. You have typical or probable UIP, you have made that diagnosis. Unfortunately, without slicing it, right? Unfortunately, multi-society guidelines, so ATS and all these other pulmonary societies, they got together and, you know, they, they, there are so many people, you know, if you get too many cooks in a kitchen, you know, sometimes, you know, your cake does, just doesn't turn out, right? Um, and so this, it, I think that's kind of what happened here. There are a lot of people with sort of um, different opinions on, on this topic, uh, depending on where they practiced. And so unfortunately in their guidelines, if you just read it at surface level, they say that if you have a probable UIP pattern on CT, they still suggest surgical lung biopsy, even though this is based on a very low quality of evidence, and this is a conditional recommendation, okay? I read this and I, I swear, I just had reflux up to here. I couldn't sleep that night. I felt like my, I felt like my parents had gotten divorced. I'm not kidding. It was just like these two very like, re respectful societies that I, that I res you know, that, that put out these great guidelines are disagreeing. So how do you resolve this? Thankfully, thankfully, uh, the main authors of the multi-society guidelines at this, up till now, I think they've written three or four editorials on this topic. Uh, because probably they're being bombarded with emails by people like me, right? People who can't sleep anymore. Uh, and so they actually have said, well, you know what? I, I know that's what the recommendations say like at surface level, but they've written these editorials that more or less say this. Okay, if you have a probable UIP pattern on CT, and you, again, you have a pri high pretest probability of IPF, you don't need to biopsy those patients. So they agree. These are the main authors on these most society guidelines. So I think now, every, you know, my, my world, my stars have all aligned. My, the world makes sense again. Um, so really the most society guidelines and the Fleischner guidelines, they agree on this topic. So really there's no, almost no difference between two guidelines now. So the trick is to choose one and to run with it. Okay, so take home points. I think the new UIP CT classification system is better than the old Guide, uh, guidelines, and I described why. How does one make an IPF diagnosis? Now there's really, for us as radiologists, there's two big ways we can do it. Exclusion of a known cause for interstitial lung disease by our clinicians, and finding a typical UIP pattern on CT, peripheral basal predominant reticulation with subpleural honeycombing, or exclusion of a known cause for interstitial lung disease and seeing a probable UIP pattern on CT. And most experts will agree with this. In more difficult cases, multidisciplinary discussion and diagnosis is usually mandated. So if you don't have a typical UIP or probable UIP pattern, you have an indeterminate for UIP pattern, or you have a non-IPF diagnosis pattern, one of those two patterns, those patients often still will require surgical lung biopsy. But still, even at that point, it's not like the pathologist makes the diagnosis. Remember, gold standard really is MDD.